Welcome back. I'm Ernie Bauer again, the chair for Southeast Asian Studies here at CSIS. We have a terrific luncheon uh, program for you. And the, the featured speaker, uh, the keynote speaker of the program is a, a good friend and a man who has uh, an incredible record as Secretary of Finance uh, of the Philippines. In a lot of ways, Cesar Parisima, Cesar Parisima was born to, uh, for this job. Uh, he was the, the leading auditor in the Philippines. So this is a man who knows where every penny uh, in organizations that he runs uh, are located. Um, and that's a big job when you're running the, uh, the Philippine government. I've known Cesar for uh, probably three decades now, and I have the highest regard for him and his integrity. You've heard earlier this morning about the results of leadership in the Philippines. And that leadership starts with President Aquino. Uh, but when it comes to the economic team, I think you've already met uh, Secretary Domingo. But in terms of the finance portfolio, uh, the buck stops with Cesar Parisima, and he's done a fantastic job. I, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, who flew in in the middle of that, that big storm last night and uh, was diverted to Norfolk. and. Uh, got into Washington at actually about two in the morning. So uh, he's also a trooper. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Cesar Parisima. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my uh, objective uh, today is not to uh, give you uh, indigestion, so please continue with your uh, lunch. Uh, I'm here to uh, uh, further uh, sh uh, share some of the developments in the country, in addition to what uh, my colleagues uh, uh, said uh, this morning. Um, Secretary Domingo, I'm sure, spoke of uh, the successes that the country has had the past uh, uh, five uh, years. Uh, I'm sure Ambassador Quisha also uh, said that. But before I uh, uh, give my uh, own uh, perspective on the developments, let me uh, greet some of our friends uh, who uh, took time out to be with us uh, uh, today. Uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Bruce Andrews of the Department of uh, Commerce, thank you uh, uh, very much. Uh, uh, as you know, the U.S. is a strategic partner of the uh, Philippines. Uh, we have collaboration across the spectrum, not just in the area of defense. Uh, in fact, we are the only country in Asia that is uh, uh, a member of the Partnership uh, for Growth. And um, uh, we are, of course, a beneficiary of the Millennium Challenge uh, uh, Corporation. Uh, we have uh, uh, one grant, and uh, now we're working on a second, courtesy of uh, our good friend here, uh, Matt uh, uh, bond. I'd like to uh, greet uh, also a long, long time investor uh, in the country, uh, Mr. Greenberg. Uh, thank you for your continuous uh, support of the country. Uh, Ambassador ne Negroponte, another good friend of the uh, Philippines, um, Ms. Uh, Carla uh, Hill, and of course her late uh, husband, uh, has always been big uh, supporters of the uh, country. Um, the new executive director representing uh, um, the Philippines in uh, the World Bank, uh, Mr. Silveira from Brazil. No? Uh, as you know, the Philippines is in Southeast Asia, and yet in the World Bank, we are part of Latin America. Actually, uh, <laughs> it's really the proper location of the Philippines. Uh, if you can uh, have a way to uh, uproot us, then I think uh, uh, we're better off uh, in uh, Latin America, but that can't be, so we just do it in the World Bank. So we're represented by Brazil in the World Bank. And then, of course, um, uh, my colleague in the cabinet, uh, uh, Secretary uh, Singson. Um, uh, friends, uh, you know, uh, thank you for being uh, here. The past uh, five years um, uh, for the Philippines has been uh, uh, one where uh, we've shown uh, what uh, good governance can do to a country. Uh, for the longest time, uh, the Philippines was looked at as a basket case. No? Uh, amongst the tigers of uh, uh, Asia. And there was really no reason why uh, uh, the Philippines should uh, underperform. 
Uh, we had uh, talented people. Uh, we had uh, natural resources. Uh, we had the right location. We spoke English. We were good friends with the largest countries in the world. We're next door neighbors to uh, uh, Japan. So again, no reason, except that uh, uh, we were not blessed with uh, uh, right leadership, the right uh, focus. And fortunately, in 2010, President Kakino, uh, as I'm sure you've heard many times, uh, was elected with a large mandate and with the right agenda of bringing better governance to the country. And uh, uh, that just shows you that I think uh, the past five years, that uh, once uh, you, you focus the country, a country in the right direction, once you walk your talk, uh, the market will give you the confidence. And when the market gave us confidence, it gave us uh, more fiscal space because uh, my borrowing costs uh, uh, reduced. No? But more importantly, companies in the country now could borrow at lower cost as well as the consumers. No? In fact, it's the latter two that has really uh, uh, been driving the uh, economy after taking the lead and the signal uh, from uh, government. Uh, when you look at uh, the growth statistics of the country, it's driven by uh, consumption, uh, as supported by a very favorable uh, uh, demography. And that consumption uh, potential has always been there, except that uh, things were not affordable. Uh, interest rates were high, the terms were short, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. But once there was certainty, once interest rates were lower, things like condominiums and cars suddenly became affordable. And that's why uh, Secretary Domingo was able to convince the president recently to uh, even open up the car sector further. Uh, because uh, as you know, our car sector is growing uh, uh, rapidly. It grew 21% uh, the first quarter of uh, uh, 2015. No? Uh, that puts more challenge for Secretary Singson to build more roads. No? But that's a good challenge. No? More cars, more roads, more economic uh, uh, development. But this story about the Philippines, no, on how, where we are right now, can only be truly appreciated if we look back at where we were uh, 10 years ago, say in 2005. I was also a finance minister for a short time then. So I know the challenges uh, at the time. Our debt to GDP uh, at that time was about 68%. No? Now it's down to 45%. Our external debt to GDP was about 30%. Now it's down to 15%. No? It's half what it used to be. Our reserves now are over four times uh, what uh, it used to be uh, then. Interest payments as a percentage of GDP is less than half now, as opposed to what it was then. That means there's more fiscal space uh, for our government to invest in infrastructure, invest in our uh, people. When you look at uh, tax um, effort, um, uh, we're now uh, close to 14%. We were around 12% uh, uh, then. Total revenue is over 15%. Again, when uh, people tend to criticize us, they look at the fact that uh, uh, we're less than 16%, which is around the benchmark of uh, uh, what uh, you know, most countries with healthy uh, fiscal positions uh, uh, have. No? But uh, I tell them that uh, we're pointed in the right direction. We've gone a long way. And therefore, I'd like to look at the glass half full rather than half empty. And when you look at our deficit, our deficit last year was at 0.6% of uh, GDP, coming from 3.5% of GDP in 2010. So a lot of progress has been done, just with a small change, no? confidence. No? Confidence is very uh, important. And this is something that um, I think we in the Philippines should not lose sight uh, of. That is the key, key currency that has allowed us to make this happen. Confidence from the market, confidence from the investors, and confidence from the consumers. And that's what President Aquino is trying to institutionalize as we speak. Now, all of this uh, were done not just by you know, giving the right speech and coming up with the right program. President Aquino has also pushed for certain key legislation that will make it easier to continue these reforms beyond this term. Among the key legislations during the term of President Aquino was the one that uh, created the Governance Commission for Government-Owned and Controlled Corporations. For the longest time, 20, 30 years ago, this was a major source of leakage, major source of inefficiency and 
corruption. But with the GOCC law now, we are able now to put in the pillars for a meritocracy in government-owned corporations. This will give us an opportunity to classify them in three buckets, which we're doing right now. Those that do government functions, we will absorb them back to national government. Those that do commercial functions, we will privatize them. And those that are in between, we will continue to nurture them so that they either go back to us or they become uh, privatized down the road. In fact, I was just talking to IFC regarding the merger of uh, the Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines. There's no reason why we should have several uh, banks. And as the interest rates go down, banking has to be a scale uh, business. So they're advising us on how to uh, go through this uh, uh, merger. The GOCC Commission will allow us to properly manage over 6 trillion pesos of asset. That's one reform. The other is the syntax law. No? This law is not a new idea, except that uh, many administrations before had not succeeded in passing it. It took over 16 years until President Aquino put in his political capital to push this. What does this bring to the table? One, uh, I hope Philip Morris and the others are not here, it will discourage smoking. No. Uh, ironically, the president is a smoker. But he sees what's good for the country and what's good for our people, so he pushed for uh, this reform. But more importantly, the proceeds of this bill will go to universal health care. And universal health care is very important, especially in our fight to alleviate poverty. The ultimate objective of President Aquino is to uh, you know, uh, have a more prosperous uh, citizenry. But to do so, you not only need to give them opportunity to have skills through education and vocational uh, uh, skills, but you also have to make sure that they are protected uh, from illness. Especially those that are near poverty, when they're hit with illness, they can easily slide back to poverty. And that's a challenge in this fight against poverty. So all the proceeds for the, new, uh, the syntax uh, law will now go to uh, healthcare. In fact, as a result of that, the budget of the healthcare department, uh, since President Aquino came to office, was increased three times. You know? The budget of the conditional cash transfer program, this is a safety net, to encourage the poorest of the poor to keep their children in school and bring them to health centers, has been increased over six times. You know? The budget in infrastructure of Secretary Singson has all been almost uh, what, dub, uh, four times. You know? And this is because of better governance. You know, our revenue did not go four times or six times. No? It almost doubled. But because we are able to approach it from a zero-based uh, uh, budgeting approach, from a performance-based uh, budgeting approach, we've been able to establish priorities, reduce inefficiencies, and you know, improve uh, you know, our fight against uh, uh, corruption. So better revenue, better focus on expenditure, more confidence from our people. That's what has brought us to where we are. Now, a big question that's asked by many people is, what about after President Aquino? As you know, the Philippines uh, uh, presidency is only one term. No? Uh, this is a reaction to the Marcos years. No? Uh, what after uh, his term, 2016? My answer to that is this. No? Since 2010, uh, people have started to feel, realize the importance of better governance in their own lives. They've seen that with better governance, uh, they can actually uh, have uh, more chances in uh, improving their uh, lives. And now that uh, they've aligned this, uh, and now that uh, they're able to get information as freely as anyone in the world with mobile telephony, and access to internet. I really believe that now we not only have uh, an engaged citizenry, but also an empowered citizenry. You should just look at the, you know, the, the uh, Facebook or social media. Uh, people are engaged on the smallest uh, issue. Uh, and uh, I think in the next elections, uh, the youth uh, will be uh, a major uh, factor. You know? Uh, the second thing is uh, the fact that uh, President Aquino is committed to have a credible 
election. In fact, he appointed recently as chair a uh, Harvard-trained uh, lawyer, uh, Chairman Bautista, um, who is uh, a political, who is uh, considered uh, uh, very competent uh, to lead the agency that will be in charge of that election. So uh, that should help us attain a credible uh, process, which I believe is very important. Uh, and third, I think uh, it's less the personality, it's more the mandate that uh, uh, whoever wins no, uh, must have a mandate to be able to continue the reform. And as things are shaping up uh, uh, right now, uh, I think uh, we'll end up with a leader that uh, people uh, will support no? uh, and will be uh, inspired to uh, continue to uh, work with, uh, especially in the area of better uh, governance. Uh, president Aquino is a young, uh, is going to be a young ex-president. He will be there. Uh, and just like his mother before him, who was uh, a fiscalizer when it comes to uh, uh, democracy, uh, President Aquino will continue to uh, fiscalize in terms of economic empowerment. Because as he sees it, he's actually trying to complete what his parents started, no? which is uh, people power. Uh, his mother started with the political uh, pillar uh, of people empowerment. But uh, another important uh, pillar is, of course, economic empowerment. And with political and economic, then you can really have true uh, empowerment. And I think uh, that's his... Uh, uh, mission in life. And that's why I'm confident that uh, beyond 2016, no, uh, the reform process will continue. It's like a genie that's out of the bottle. It's hard to uh, push back because it's, it came at the right time when people have been empowered. Finally, uh, the Philippines has the right DNA. No? What is uh, DNA? No? Uh, D uh, for demography. Uh, the Philippines is the youngest country in um, Asia. Uh, we are also in a sweet spot no, where uh, the bulk of our population are currently in a, a working age uh, between 15 and uh, 60, and uh, that will remain so for the next uh, 40 years. No? And um, when you look around, in ASEAN in particular, uh, a lot of the leading countries are practically full employment. They need people, and we have people resources, and that's why the president is really emphasizing investment in uh, people. Uh, in, by 2030, it is estimated that uh, two-thirds of the world's middle class will be in Asia. So that's why it's important that uh, we take advantage of this demographic uh, dividend. And uh, natural uh, resources. Uh, the Philippines has had 13 straight years of uh, current account surplus, uh, and that's the reason why our reserves have continued to go up. That's uh, started before by the remittances. Now with uh, BPO expected to surpass remittances, we have two strong legs. And then we're working on a third, uh, third leg, which is tourism. I think we breached five million tourist arrivals, and within a year or two, we expect to breach 10 uh, uh, million. And if we do hit 10 million, tourism can easily become as much as the BPO industry in terms of remittances. So you have a third strong leg. But more importantly, on the fourth leg, which is natural endowment. Philippines is the fifth most uh, uh, endowed uh, country uh, in terms of mineralization in the world. Uh, so far, we haven't really taken advantage of that from a current account standpoint. That can become a fourth strong leg. So we're confident that we will have the resources to continue to fund uh, the growth of the country, both investment as well as consumption. Then finally, A. No? A is Asia, ASEAN. No? Uh, many writers have uh, talked about the fact that the 21st century is going to be the Asian century. Obviously, that's not uh, preordained. But uh, when you look at sheer numbers of, uh, of uh, population, uh, where over half of the world's population will be there, sheer size of the uh, GNP, uh, uh, Asia, uh, definitely has the uh, potential uh, to really uh, be the driver for growth uh, of the world in this uh, uh, century. The Philippines is well positioned in this uh, uh, context because uh, one, it's going to be part of a more integrated ASEAN, you know, and in a more integrated ASEAN, uh, Philippines can position itself as a gateway to ASEAN for North Asia, we being the closest uh, southern neighbor of uh, uh, Japan. We can also be the gateway to ASEAN and Asia for Latin America 
or even across the uh, Pacific. And that is why investments in uh, connectivity in terms of infrastructure, uh, entering into agreements uh, such as Secretary Domingo is doing right now to really uh, support connectivity, not just from an infrastructure standpoint, but also from a policy standpoint is, to, is, is going to be uh, crucial. You know, very few of us know that uh, Asia up to the 1850s was the world's largest uh, uh, economy. From 1 BC to 1850, Asia was bigger than the rest uh, of Europe and uh, uh, the Western uh, world. But it lost it the past 200 years. No? It can get it back, no? and assuming it does, then uh, Philippines can play a big, a, a big role. And that's why I hope that uh, Philippines and the U.S., uh, given our long, uh, special historical relationship, can work closely together so that uh, we can both benefit uh, from this coming Asian uh, century. After all, uh, the U.S., although it is in North America, is in the Pacific, and it is the world's uh, superpower. And I do hope that uh, uh, with your uh, investment, with your support, with your encouragement, uh, we will be able to realize the potential of our partnership and the potential of the Philippines. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the Secretary has uh, generously offered to uh, take some of your questions. I'd like to uh, open the floor. Same rules, just let us know who you are and your institution, and uh, welcome uh, your question. Eric Lachica from the U.S. Filipinos for Good Governance. Yes, uh, the uh, President Aquino, I think when he was in Japan, uh, was interviewed and he said that uh, he decided not to pursue the membership of the Philippines in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. What are your thoughts on that uh, decision? Uh, the President did not say that. No. Uh, in fact, um, uh, we have also not committed yet. No? Uh, but we are uh, part of the uh, process. No? Uh, the commitment phase, I think, will start uh, by the end of the month and uh, all the way to December. No? Uh, there are over 57 countries and all ASEAN countries that are part of the uh, process. Um, obviously, uh, we are looking at this uh, issue uh, not purely from, not just from an economic standpoint, but from a holistic uh, uh, standpoint. Uh, we do have uh, concerns regarding governance, and we're watching carefully uh, what are the governance mechanisms uh, that they're putting uh, uh, in place, uh, what will be the basis for granting of uh, uh, loans, and whether this will become more of a political rather than a financial uh, arm. So the decision has not been made, but we are uh, part of the uh, process. Uh, we do hope uh, that uh, this will turn out to be a, a, a real uh, financial uh, uh, institution operated uh, uh, from a purely uh, uh, financial and uh, uh, need standpoint, not from a political standpoint, because the demand uh, for infrastructure in the region is quite substantial. The ADB estimates that uh, over the next 10 years, uh, we will need over a trillion dollars in the region. In ASEAN alone, about uh, 1.2 trillion. In the Philippines, over 100 billion dollars. Uh, uh, so, uh, Asian Development Bank, with its increased capitalization, Japan, with its new focus on uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, Prime Minister came out with these four pillars of infrastructure, including uh, 110 billion dollars that will be offered as additional support uh, uh, for its uh, uh, partners. Um, I think it's not enough. Now, in fact, private sector uh, will have to uh, uh, step in. No? And that is why, as an aside, I forgot to mention uh, uh, our APEC initiative, which is the Cebu Action Plan. One of the pillars is uh, uh, PPP uh, initiative. What we want to create is an APEC standard for PPP. Uh, APEC standard in terms of definition of terms, APEC standard in terms of covenants, and an APEC passport for companies that are involved in uh, uh, PPP so that uh, a, country, a company that's involved in one country for PPP doesn't have to requalify in another uh, country. Because the need is so great, it cannot just be from public and multilateral uh, uh, 
uh, funding. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, you talked about uh, the likelihood that good governance would last uh, beyond the next presidential transition, and you talked about social media as helping out in this. Can you tell us uh, something about the role of the legislature uh, in uh, making policy uh, in the Philippines and what its role in good governance might or might not be? Well. There are three branches in, uh, in uh, government, just like in the Philippine government, just like the U.S. No? Uh, the ones that are most susceptible to immediate uh, uh, impact by the people are those that are subject to re-election. And that's the uh, executive branch uh, with the president uh, uh, ha having to be elected, as well as the legislature. In fact, the legislature have to refresh their mandate, uh, the lower house, every uh, three years, and the Senate, half of them, every three years, will also have to get a new uh, mandate. And uh, when you look at uh, people's involvement now, uh, at least when I look at the social media, uh, they are now uh, more engaged. Unlike uh, towards the end of the Arroyo administration, they were more apathetic. No? Uh, there was this uh, uh, hopelessness. No? Uh, but I think now they've realized that uh, uh, better governed Philippines is a possibility within their lifetime. And that realization, I think, uh, is driving them to make sure that this becomes uh, a reality rather than just a, a dream. Uh, we cannot, uh, uh, you know, underestimate the, the, or overestimate the impact of, uh, of social media. Go around the world, no? uh, the changes that are happening or the movements that are going on. Um, in Hong Kong, for example, a uh, country that's uh, quite uh, uh, small but controlled. No? Uh, you have people demanding that uh, they have more say in the choices of their uh, leaders. So in a way, we're blessed that uh, this uh, change that President Aquino uh, is doing uh, is happening at the right time uh, when people have access to information. Hi, thanks, Mr. Secretary. Um, two quick questions. So um, first of all, you mentioned, uh, just to follow up on the AIB question, um, you've mentioned a number of times now the concerns that you have regarding governance standards, as well as China potentially using it as a political rather than a financial tool. Um, I'm wondering what kind of clarifications from China would sort of assuage your worries or concerns regarding these two things? Um, and then secondly, with respect to the very interesting initiative you talked about that's, I guess, in the Cebu Action Plan, about what, what the? Uh, the infrastructure and PPPs, oh. Oh. Um, which is also in the Cebu Action Plan. Yeah. I'm wondering um, if you could tell us a little bit more about that um, and what might be some of the difficulties or challenges getting this through, because it's obviously a, it's a very interesting initiative, but I think there may be some minor disagreements by some countries about that initiative. Thanks. Well, uh, first on the um, AIIB, uh, obviously um, we have to look at the documents. No? So, for example, uh, we're looking at uh, the composition of uh, the board. Uh, um, they will have a board of governors. No? So all member countries will have one uh, member. But the working uh, uh, board would really be the board of directors. No? And we're looking at that, the composition. Right now, uh, based on what we've seen, uh, there are positive signals. For example, uh, uh, there are 12 members. Uh, and uh, there's a provision there that says, uh, that uh, only uh, uh, one nationality uh, per member, uh, per, uh, for each, uh, for each nationality should only have one member. No? So even though China may have, what, 30%, they cannot have three representatives uh, uh, there. Then they broke up that board into uh, 75, 25, nine, and three. Uh, nine for the regional members and three for the non-regional uh, uh, members and then uh, there are other provisions, but uh, obviously we're looking at the fine print no? uh, to make sure that uh, not only is it uh, put in uh, writing, that it will also be done in actuality. No? So uh, those are some of the things that uh, uh, we're looking at. Now the Cebu uh, action plan, um, we've had um, 
meeting in Bagak recently, in uh, near Bataan, no? uh, um, and um, we're close to a finalization of uh, an action plan with four pillars. No? Uh, the first is uh, promote uh, financial markets uh, integration. The second is to advance uh, fiscal transparency and policy reform. Third is enhance uh, financial resiliency. And fourth is to accelerate infra development and uh, financing. What I mentioned uh, earlier was part of the fourth uh, uh, pillar. No. Now, there are some countries in the APEC uh, region that do not want to put as many specifics yet. No. But for us, this is a good start because unlike the trade uh, group, no, uh, finance has really been on an ad hoc basis uh, in APEC. Uh, the host basically sets an agenda and then that's what you discuss. And then the next host tries to pick it up from uh, what the uh, previous uh, host uh, took up. No? So that's why during the retreat in Beijing of the financial ministers, we agreed that we'll try to come up with a roadmap that will then support the trade agenda. Because the trade the goals have been there for the longest uh, uh, time. No? And I think uh, if uh, this is ultimately adopted, this will be a breakthrough. And then this can become the roadmap uh, for uh, hopefully uh, uh, faster integration of the region in terms of the financial markets. After all, uh, trade doesn't uh, occur in a vacuum. It occurs in the financial markets. Now you need money, you need credit, uh, letters of credit, you need to go through banks. No? And uh, the, the, the more integrated the markets are, the banks are, the standards are, the credit bureaus are, the better it would be. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the, the faster we can accomplish the goal of truly having uh, an integrated uh, market that will result to more inclusive growth. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Thank uh, Secretary. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, call on our, our partners uh, in this endeavor. Uh, the uh, U.S. Philippine Society in the person of uh, Ambassador John Negroponte to make a special presentation. John. Good Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Ernie Bauer, for uh, CSIS uh, giving us the hospitality of, of uh, hosting this conference, and of course, we in the U.S. Philippine Society and the Embassy of the Philippines have been pleased to support uh, this endeavor, and it fits right in with the purposes of the U.S. Philippine Society, which is to uh, elevate the profile uh, of the Philippines, uh, not only in the capital of our country, but uh, throughout the United States, and I think uh, the kind of mission uh, that we're receiving today, led by three such able uh, cabinet ministers, I think uh, contributes uh, enormously to that. Uh, I want to be remembered as uh, the person who gave the briefest uh, speech uh, here today so that we can both uh, get back uh, on our schedule and so that I can make another speaking commitment that I have in about uh, 30 uh, minutes uh, time. Uh, and I think most of what I would have said in my prepared remarks uh, has been said in one way or another today. But suffice it to mention just a couple of key points. First, the pivot, so-called. I, I don't really agree with that term because we've been in the Pacific for a long, long time, starting in the 19th century. And certainly, our relationship with the Philippines is a testament to that, which, which goes back uh, to the end of the 19th century. And that, of course, it is a very storied uh, and deep uh, relationship uh, indeed. But in any case, whatever you think of the term, I think it's important, and I think we all agree, that the uh, A Asian region is becoming the demographic and the economic sort of center, epicenter, of the global economy. Uh, and so we need to be thinking uh, about the implications uh, of that fact. And uh, as has been mentioned by several, clearly the Philippines is uh, very well situated uh, to take advantage uh, of uh, the, these developments. And uh, I think 
if they play their cards right, and that's of course what we've been hearing about today, about the question of good governance and the uh, highly skilled and able and capable uh, Filipino people, uh, the country should be able to continue to make the kinds of impressive progress that it has made in the last several years. And believe me, as somebody who was ambassador to the Philippines back from 19 93 to 1996, which was also a good period for the Philippines, but I think it, it, there's been significant progress since that time, and particularly since the beginning of President Aquino's uh, administration. So I think we all uh, have, are hopeful for the future of the Philippines. Uh, we know there's always these political question marks, and we're gonna have to see uh, what happens in a couple of years' time when the country again comes under uh, a new administration. One takeaway from this meeting uh, that I have, and I heard uh, Mr. Secretary Greg Domingo say it here, uh, was that the Philippines wants to join the TPP. If I, if I had to write a headline uh, uh, from this meeting and I'd been an AP correspondent, so that's, what I've, that's when I would have left the room. Uh, uh, to go file uh, my report. Now you can do it with a tweet or whatever, right from your, wherever it is you're sitting. Uh, but that's important, I think, uh, and I don't know what the Senate has done today or whether it's voted yet, but uh, we're gonna soon have trade promotion authority, which is gonna pave the way for this TPP, this Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it's probably gonna be the most strategic thing that this administration has done uh, in its eight years in office, if it gets it done. And if it's fortunate enough to also get the European one done, wow, that's really gonna be a big deal. I mean, these two huge sort of uh, continental uh, wide uh, uh, trading arrangements. So I, you know, I, for one, am all for that, just like I was for the NAFTA when I served as our ambassador to Mexico. And I think that we could be living in really, in, in trade and economic terms, it's a very momentous times. Indeed, I hope we get the TPP, and I hope that we can then eventually pave the way for membership by countries such as the Philippines who wish to, uh, wish to join. And I hope whatever is necessary to be done to get that done uh, will be done. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct honor to take uh, this opportunity, and it is a special occasion for us, uh, to recognize uh, Mr. Hank Greenberg, uh, the honorary chair of the U.S. Philippine Society. He's also a trustee of the CSIS. This is a twofer, Hank. You got two birds with one stone. And member of the Sumitro Chair for Southeast Asia Studies Advisory Board. So I was uh, wondering if I could trouble Mr. Greenberg and Ambassador Quisia to come up to the stage for just one moment while I make this uh, presentation to Mr. Greenberg. Maybe if you all could come up here. Either way, I guess. Oh, there's no stairs there. You better come over here. Hank, the stairs are over here. <laughs> we don't want to make you high jump. <laughs> Well, you probably can do it. <laughs> so uh, this conference on the theme of uh, promoting business ties between our countries is the ideal venue to recognize a man who has done so much to create opportunities in that area over many years. So Hank, in recognition of your indispensable support for the U.S. Philippine Society, and for exceptional service in strength, strengthening ties between America and the Philippines, our board of directors has chosen to name you as a re recipient of the Society's 2015 Carlos P. Romulo Award. On behalf of my co-chair, Manny Pangilinan, uh, I am honored to present you with this award along with our best wishes for continued success. Uh, 
I'll be very brief. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for that award. Um, I've had a long relationship with the Philippines, and my predecessor, the founder of our company, really started it all. And uh, I'm always pleased to go back there. I'll be there actually in a, maybe two weeks. Um, Joey Kresher and I were working in the same company. Uh, he ran our business in the Philippines, did a great job, as he's doing a great job as ambassador. Thank you very much. That was a special one. Uh, I got to say, um, from the minute I started working on Southeast Asia, I think Hank Greenberg was, in, in one way or another, my boss. Uh, I think he still is. So uh, <laughs> Hank, congratulations. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is the guy who puts everything together. Uh, he's the man who, in the Philippine cabinet, uh, links the private sector and the public sector. He is in charge of building infrastructure in this country uh, or, or helping to enable uh, the building of infrastructure in his country. And it's, he's a very good choice to do so. As you've heard earlier, uh, he, uh, he uh, has uh, a tremendous program underway. He knows what he's talking about, too. He was recruited for this job by President Aquino uh, from a position where he was running one of the most uh, most successful uh, privatized companies uh, in the Philippines, Manilad uh, Water Services. Uh, he was president and chief executive of that company um, uh, for uh, four years before he was uh, elevated to the cabinet. I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Rajalio Singsong, the uh, secretary of the Public Works and Highways uh, for the Republic of the Philippines. Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Ernie, uh, and good afternoon. I know it's a difficult time for you. Uh, I think uh, it's also a difficult time for me because it's about 2 o'clock in the morning in Manila time. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'd like to just greet uh, Deputy Secretary Bruce Andrews, uh, Ambassador, uh, my good friend Ambassador Negroponte and Ambassador Hubbard, um, Ambassador Carla Hill. Uh, the World Bank Executive Director, Sil Mr. Silveria. I did mention that DPWH is one of the biggest users of US, I mean World Bank uh, loans in the Philippines. Of course, uh, Ambassador Joey Quisha, who comes from the same school as I come from, not from the other school. <laughs> <laughs> My colleagues uh, in the cabinet, uh, the business delegates from Manila, Colleagues, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'll go straight to the point. Why am I here? What I am going to propose is uh, we kept mentioning uh, the presence, would you like to increase the presence of the U.S. construction companies in the Philippines? But let me show you the big picture. The big picture for the U.S. companies is really ASEAN. The ASEAN integration has a total, has become the sixth largest economy with 625 million population. All of the 10 member countries, maybe except for Singapore, all of them will need infrastructure investment this coming years. So look at it at the big picture. Don't confine yourself to the Philippines. But however, how do you become competitive in the ASEAN market? The, my answer is simple. The business model we are proposing is locate in the Philippines, register as a company in the Philippines, and avail of the millions of engineers, construction workers all over, all over the Middle East who will just love to work just around the Philippines in the ASEAN market. So that's my direct business proposition. 
Now, the only missing link in the past was that for you to locate in the Philippines as a construction company, you had to register every time you want to get a project in the Philippines. So what we've done, and the President has approved this and signed a proclamation that now allows foreign contractors to be registered as a new category, what we call quadruple A, quadruple A construction permit. You now are given a regular contractor's permit so that you don't have to work for every single construction permit every time you work. So um, the president signed this, and uh, the, this is the model that foreign companies are doing in Singapore. They've allowed the foreign contractors 100%. However, why register in Singapore? Where will you get your engineers? Where will you get your construction workers, your equipment operators? You still have to go to the Philippines or some other ASEAN countries. So we opened up this quadruple A precisely for foreign contractors to be competitive in the ASEAN market. Now, having said that, as, as you have seen, the Philippines itself offers a lot of construction opportunities. In terms of our growth in 2011, the total investment in infrastructure was only at $4 billion. I'm just talking about investment in infrastructure. In 2016, this will go up to almost $18 billion. So from $4 billion to $18 billion. And where will this investment go? This will go into road construction, the water sector, rail, airports, um, the other, I'm excluding here the PPP because the PPP is private sector. I'm just talking here of public sector investments. Now, in terms of the department itself, TPWH, when we started, we had about less than 80% of our road network, what we call national roads, as being paved. By 2016, our national primary and secondary roads will all be paved by then. Okay? So I think if you have visited the Philippines recently, other than maybe Metro Manila, because it really affects traffic congestion, we have to schedule it properly, but if you go outside Metro Manila, you will see the development of our road networks um, tremendously different from five, six years ago. Uh, for example, we had our Independence Day celebration in Iloilo. In Iloilo, I was talking earlier to someone from Iloilo, we have 10 lane boulevards in Iloilo now with bike lanes. So it's not a typical two lane with 10 lanes with an, a bike lane provided for. Now, and this is happening all over the Philippines. Now. Aside from roads and bridges that we're mandated to do, we have our convergence program with other agencies. First is tourism convergence program. With the Department of Tourism, they continue to promote tourism. However, in the past, roads leading to tourist destinations were local barangay roads. So they are not paved, the local communities do not have the funds. So from 2011, we've invested over 50 billion to support tourism destinations. The master plan of the Department of Tourism has been identified in what they call the tourism master plan, and all of the designated primary or uh, primary tourist destinations we have paved. Unfortunately, uh, when the local governments learned about this program, all of a sudden, I realized that the Philippines has many waterfalls. They're now all of a sudden sprouting all over the country. Everybody wants the, the local waterfalls to be paved. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're sticking to our, our uh, tourism uh, infrastructure plan. The second area is in developing infrastructure for agricultural development. So we're now doing an honest-to-goodness farm-to-market roads, not dictated by political parties, but where are these food production areas that we can connect to the market? So there's an ongoing program at, uh, at the rate of about 
two to 3,000 kilometers of farm-to-market roads. We hope to be able to do as much as 5,000 this year and next year. The third major convergence program is in the water sector. So if you're in the water sector, whether you're building dams, you're in the sanitation, you're in the water distribution, you're in flood management, we are investing heavily to making sure that we are able to utilize water resources efficiently. So we're looking at, we've identified our 19 major rivers. So we are adopting integrated water resources management principles from upstream to downstream so that we're able to optimize our water resources. And this includes the use for domestic use, hydropower, flood management, as well as irrigation. The third, the fourth area of convergence is in the in transport system. We're now connecting all major airports, seaports, rural ports to our national road network. A major component that was mentioned earlier about uh, Mindanao. We've started developing the Mindanao Integrated Logistics Network. Since we started, we've been budgeting 30% of DPWH to Mindanao. So islands that used to be isolated like Tawi-Tawi, uh, Basilan, uh, Sulu, they're now, we're completing the circumferential roads uh, in these island provinces. So 30% is going to go to Mindanao and we will continue to complete the Mindanao logistics network, connecting food production areas, tourism destinations, to major airports, seaports, and rural ports. So in terms of DPWH again, uh, we've had very successful implementation of what we re refer to as the high standard highway around Metro Manila and 200 kilometers around Metro Manila. So we have had 152 kilometers of ongoing uh, toll roads we're implementing 188 kilometers more, and we will be bidding out an additional of 72 kilometers. So these roads are either going to be toll roads or they will be financed by government but operated by the private sector for the operations and maintenance. So this goes all the way to uh, Cabanatuan, north of Metro Manila, all the way to the south in Batangas area, so that we're able to, the whole objective of the high standard highway is to decongest Metro Manila and make Metro Manila a little bit more livable. Together with the road network would be the uh, rail system that uh, my colleague Under Secretary Lim Kauko will be dis uh, dis discussing with you a bit later. Let me just mention one major project that we are launching and it's Bidding will happen sometime November. This is the Laguna Lake Expressway Dike Project. This is our biggest PPP so far. It has several components. It's a road dike, uh, expressway, at the same time flood control, and at the same time land reclamation. Whoever's going to win this, win this bid will be given the right to reclaim some 700 hectares of prime property because then they will be able to really develop a 700 lakeside prime property. I was directly involved in the Fort Bonifacio development, so we know exactly what the market can absorb. And of course, the 700 hectares is three times the size of Fort Bonifacio. But I, we strongly feel that having this development in the lakeside would give a, the developer an opportunity upscale uh, land development. So we have continued to also go into new areas as far as road is concerned. We just uh, continue to bid out what we refer to as long-term road maintenance. If possible, we don't even want the PWH to do these roads. If the private sector can do it, we'll just pay them on a regular basis. So far, we've bidded out five, and for your information, four of them were won by Chinese contractors, so there's no problem as far as 
accepting Chinese contractors in the construction market, and one by Korean. No U.S. company has participated, unfortunately. And that's why we're saying you should look at the business model so that you're more competitive, not only in the Philippines, but in the ASEAN, where all of these 10 member countries, except maybe for Singapore, they will need all of the infrastructure that we're getting into in their own countries. Um, let me end by saying that uh, we will continue to focus to make sure that uh, the gains in the department will be institutionalized. So our role has been simple. We took over the department, one of the always top three noted most notorious, most corrupt agency. We had a simple program. Good governance and anti-corruption was the main program. However, it couldn't be just hype. We also had to deliver safer and better quality road network. So um, when, I, when we say good governance, we had to look at the total system, making sure that we fund the right projects. We had to, to make sure that we look at the right costs in terms of the bidding, that it is competitive and uh, full accountability and transparency. We had to make sure at the quality so slowly, we upgraded the quality of our registered contractors. Um, we recently got DPWH itself, ISO certified for quality management system, one of only three national agencies who has ISO certified. Right people as well as right implementation. It used to be that we had almost 20,000 plantilla people in the department. We were able to reduce, four, we were able to remove 4,500. We brought it down to a little over 15,000, in spite of our budget increasing fourfold. So we're saying we're a lot more efficient this time. We've gotten rid of people we have to get rid of through early retirement, uh, separation, uh, filing cases against them, just to make sure that the department no longer is going to be in the top three notorious departments. So we've, been, uh, we've gotten headway there. It's not the perfect system. Uh, we're saying it, it took several generations for the department to be where it was. So I hope five years, six years, is uh, not too long to make the, the, the changes, but we're confident that we've institutionalized the reforms in the department. The other thing is uh, we've hired, we run a cadet engineering program where we hire the best and the brightest registered civil engineers nationwide. We get them through a management training program so that we are assured that we have the next generation running the department. After all, what we have been doing is really for the future generations. So these are the programs that to me would like to leave in the department as our legacy. Get the young people who are highly qualified idealistic, run the department. So we're now, for example, when we started, the average age was close to, they say 57 was the average age. Now we're down to 43 years old. And the new hires that we are getting has to be no older than 30 years. So <laughs> just to make sure that we have the young cadet engineers running the department after 2016. So ladies and gentlemen, as I said, my business proposition, US companies have to look at the ASEAN market. And how do you do that? We've created the avenue by opening a quadruple A registration for foreign contractors. So with that, uh, just again invite 
uh, construction companies and engineering related companies to come to the Philippines and compete in the ASEAN market. Good afternoon and thank you very much. Thank you again. Uh, Nelson Garcia, Washington Intergovernmental Professional Group. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, the issue of the airports in Manila. Uh, the, the, there was talk initially about expanding the airport at Naia by creating a new runway and possibly, uh, obviously, ne the need to modernize the three terminals that are still uh, uh, basically uh, get, getting old. Uh, but there was also talk about incorporating Clark as a replacement for Naia. Can you please uh, talk a little bit about what the long-term plans are for those two airports? And secondly, are we looking at the potential uh, of additional gateways from the Philippines beyond Manila and Cebu to the outside yes. world? Um, I'd, I'd like to keep uh, get uh, Undersecretary Lim Kauko answer you, because uh, airports and seaports are really under the Department of Transport and Communication. But I know there are plans, and uh, they're now just finalizing how we will develop the second gateway in Metro Manila. So if you don't mind, uh, Secret Undersecretary Lim Kaogo can give you an answer when his turn uh, comes into this afternoon. Well, uh, again, when I took over my NILAD, we were, you, I hate to say this, but most of the government employees ended up with my NILAD. So my first objective, unfortunately, I had to do it Christmas time, I, were distrib I was distributing pink slips. So we had to get rid of at least 30%. To my mind, to create an impact, you have to replace at least 30% of an organization to really turn it around. Replacing 10% doesn't create that much impact. So to me, 30% had to go. So uh, of course, you had uh, employees union, but I said, I'll have to explain to them that this is the way to go moving forward. Otherwise, uh, remember when we took over Manila, uh, this was the second reprivatization. It was not successful, successful in the first 10 years uh, for some other reasons other than personnel. So to me, 30%. And that's what I did in DPWH as well. I had to clean up up to 30%. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the Secretary. We are now uh, going to welcome the next panel, uh, which will dig deeply into uh, the investment opportunities uh, in the infrastructure and po private public partnerships in the Philippines. Um, and that will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Scott Kennedy, who is the direct deputy director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies and has uh, studied this area extensively and, uh, and our panel. So if uh, I could just call up the uh, panel, please. They'll be right with you. Just introduce them.
Yeah. You do your job. Okay. There we go. All right. So anyway, uh, good afternoon. I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm uh, with the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I do research and write about China's economy, both domestic and international. Uh, in my former life uh, as a professor at Indiana University, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about the politics of development across the region uh, from Sapporo uh, to Singapore, uh, and I'm delighted to have the chance to, to moderate this panel on uh, public-private partnerships in the Philippines. Uh, we have a very distinguished group of, of experts here this afternoon. Uh, you have their full bios in the materials that you have, so there's no need for me to spend a lot of time going over that. Um, I'll just say, um, by, by way of introduction, before we get turned to each of them, uh, that uh, in, in my experience and the experience of, of just observing countries, there's no one uh, model of economic development of how countries uh, raise their standards of living and, and become f uh, prosperous countries. Uh, you, there's just many different flavors of, of development and the role of the state uh, changes over time. Uh, and at different stages of development, uh, the state plays a different role. But one of the things that we're gonna highlight in this panel is the role of the private sector changes across countries and changes over time. And the idea that the uh, private-public partnerships uh, can, uh, are very important for infrastructure and providing public goods uh, is, is, is uh, something we're going to explore, uh, both the history, experience, and the possibilities. Uh, so uh, to do, uh, bring that explanation forward to share with you, we have four excellent panelists. Uh, Cosette Canilla who is the Executive Director of Private, Public Private Partnership Center in the Philippines. Uh, Guillermo Luchango is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Investment and Capital Corporation of the Philippines. Uh, Robert Prieto, who is the Senior Vice President for Infrastructure at Floor Corporation. And Bernie Sheehan, who is the Director of Infrastructure and Natural Resources at the IFC. So each of our speakers will make introductory remarks in about five to seven minutes. Uh, and then uh, we'll turn it over to uh, you all for a vigorous uh, conversation. So let's t first turn things over to Gazette. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Philippines has always recognized the crucial role of the private sector in the, in our, in our, in the development of our infrastructure. As a matter of fact, the passage of the Build, Operate, Transfer Law in 1990 institutionalized the role of the private sector in infrastructure development. This was later uh, amended to include non-traditional and social infrastructure projects for the agriculture, health, and education sector. Under President Aquino's uh, term, he further bolstered the role of the public-private partnerships in addressing infrastructure gaps in our country. He reorganized the Build, Operate, uh, Transfer Center into Public-Private Partnership Center through Executive Order 8. The PPP Center, is the sole, PPP Center of the Philippines is the sole body tasked to facilitate and coordinate the country's uh, PPP program. Part of its mandate, aside from providing technical advisory in the project development and management of uh, uh, the, uh, the implementing agency's uh, PPP projects is also to, ma to manage a revolving fund called the Project Development and Monitoring Facility. This fund is utilized uh, to, uh, for the conduct of pre-investment activities and bid management of PPP projects. Uh, this fund is, util uh, is uh, it allowed implementing agencies to hire uh, renowned transaction advisors to ensure that uh, we put together bankable and viable PPP projects. Um, since uh, 2010, we have uh, already um, um, awarded 10 PPP contracts with an estimated project cost of about 4.2 billion US dollars. We are currently uh, uh, procuring or bidding out uh, 12 uh, PPP projects uh, worth about 7.7 um, .7 billion. And of these uh, 12 PPP projects, eight come from uh, the Department of Transportation and Communication, and one from the DPWH, which Secretary Singson mentioned earlier as our biggest PPP project thus far, the Laguna Lakeshore Development Projects. 
We also have a social infrastructure um, project in the, the 12 that we are currently bidding out, and that's the regional prisons facilities and the uh, two water projects. On top of that, uh, we have uh, three projects that uh, have already been approved by our by the National Economic Development Authority Board, chaired by the President. And uh, these three projects we are looking at uh, rolling out in the next two months. And one of these is, again, uh, the, uh, the very ambitious uh, 709 kilometers rail project under the Department of Transportation and Communication. The, 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 those, uh, these three projects, uh, estimated project cost is around 4.2 billion U.S. dollars. We are, uh, we are also um, trying to secure approval for six more projects which we intend to uh, launch and uh, award by, before the president steps down. And these six projects, uh, project cost is around 4.6 billion U.S. dollars. So um, we have worked so hard. The, um, the, the, the Philippine government has worked really hard in ensuring, uh, in creating an enabling environment for PPPs that, and that ensures transparency and level playing field, not only for local investors, but, uh, but for foreign investors as well. And we continue to do so. We continue to face challenges, but we also continue to address these challenges through partnerships with uh, uh, multilateral agencies, with World Bank, IFC, ADB, uh, JICA, and other partners that help us promote um, um, best practices in doing PPPs. Um, that's it for me, Scott. Uh, thank you very much. That's a, a very uh, terrific summary. I think I counted somewhere about, about 41 or so projects, either that you've already started or, or that are in the works. So it's, it's quite a lot, and it adds up to a, 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 not a small amount of, of, of funding overall. Uh, I'll turn things over now to Guillermo. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to draw a little more fo focus on, uh, on the manufacturing sector for those of you who represent manufacturing companies, because uh, we covered a lot of ground this morning, but a lot of it was uh, either financial institution type or uh, government administration type. And I think that uh, the story on the manufacturing front uh, really deserves a lot of attention. Uh, one example for that, if I may just uh, uh, relate it to you, uh, I was with the um, uh, President Aquino's uh, state visit to Japan just about a month ago, and what really amazed the Philippine delegation was that, whereas in the past we would have to be begging them to come to the Philippines or explaining why they should be in the Philippines, during that, um, that uh, visit to Japan, it was the Japanese who were telling us why they were coming to the Philippines. We didn't have to convince them. They, they were already, it was almost as if the nation had on its own decided they had to be in the Philippines. And in truth, the um, in the uh, industrial estates in the Philippines today, the biggest um, uh, nationality pouring into the Philippines now are the Japanese. And uh, in a sense, um, we would certainly like to see uh, that kind of an attitude um, take hold in the United States as well, because after all, we have had a much longer history of um, cooperation and uh, support between the Americans and the uh, Filipinos. And as you know, uh, Americans are always welcome in the Philippines. So what is the reason that uh, Japan has had this major turnaround and, and why I think you should also uh, consider it? Um, well, the obvious things have been mentioned. We really are in a sweet spot in terms of our population because the median age is 23. And I think the statistic is that 75% of the people are 40 and under. So we, uh, I think it was Secretary Domingo who mentioned that uh, uh, we'll be in this sweet spot for maybe 40 years to come. Uh, so that, that is one attractive factor about the Philippines. And then as you know, we've always been known to have very productive labor and English speaking, you don't have to translate your manuals into some other language. Uh, your, your, your people can address uh, the workers directly and be understood with, with, without the need for translation. Uh, and of course, um, the uh, comp comparatively uh, lower cost of uh, manpower in the Philippines uh, that we have to offer and the fact that we still have a lot of available manpower. Um, the uh, Director General of uh, PESA uh, likes to say that, you know, in the Philippines you don't even have to put an ad out. If you, in the papers, when you open your factory, you just put a sign outside 
on the gate of the factory and people will be lining up to, to apply. You know? So uh, th that having been said, I think what, what has added to that recently, which has improved the uh, attraction of the Philippines, is the fact that uh, the president has had this uh, drive against corruption, which really shows up uh, in his sincerity uh, of uh, not, uh, not being corrupt. No? I think that's a very important factor because a lot of people get bothered by it. Uh, and now that we have uh, convinced uh, uh, the foreign nations that, uh, we are, that we have a government that intends to root out corruption, uh, now they're really starting to pour in. And uh, don't be uh, confused if sometimes you come to the Philippines and you see that the um, uh, um, newspapers are, are talking about uh, um, corruption cases, etc. Uh, the simple reason for that is in order to root it out, you have to take action against corruption. So you'll see these things coming out. But the important thing is that there is, from the top, uh, there is this drive to root it out. No? So that, I think that's a... Uh, another important factor uh, that uh, uh, should be considered, and I think this is one of the reasons, for instance, that the Japanese are now uh, coming into the Philippines in such strong numbers. The, it's, uh, uh, we, my, my group uh, runs industrial estates, and we have really seen uh, the, that the uh, majority of the um, uh, nationalities coming into the factories nowadays are uh, Japanese at the moment, and we hope uh, the Americans will counterbalance that uh, with their own uh, manufacturing facilities. And the thing about the Philippines also, it's part of the, the ASEAN region, and it, it's been referred to that, you know, this economic integration uh, program for ASEAN is uh, coming into place, and uh, definitely this enables you to have a, um, uh, a base in ASEAN, which is going to be friendly to your uh, uh, industries. <coughs> So for, for those reasons, I think uh, it, it's, uh, it's a good time to come into the Philippines. And uh, it's also, uh, from the standpoint of the expatriates you have to send into the Philippines to live, uh, it's always been uh, a, an attractive place for uh, your people to, to live in uh, when they put up their uh, businesses there. No? And with the government now uh, exerting all effort to streamline and become more efficient, uh, I think that uh, you will find that uh, uh, it's, it's a lot different now and it's easier to do business than it was before. Uh, and one last thing I'd like to say is, uh, there was a question brought up here and we've come across this question many times uh, before. Uh, you know, what happens in 2016 when we have an election and we have a new president? And uh, I, I just wanna say that uh, maybe the Filipinos uh, themselves uh, have to look into the issue of who they want to, to govern the Philippines. But one thing that I, I can say is normally the uh, foreign manufacturing companies or, or for foreign companies in general are not very affected by who is the president because we're not talking with any of the candidates that have any chance of winning, we're not talking about a radical change in government. We're, uh, we don't intend to go back into the, a dictatorship or a radically, radically left-leaning uh, government. Uh, that's not on the cards, no. And uh, one thing that uh, I can say to, uh, two things I can say to substantiate that and then I'll shut up. Uh, the first one is that if you look at the uh, Filipino business plan today, the, all the big leading Filipino business uh, interests, they are all pouring money into the Philippines. The PPP program, for instance, have, uh, many of the winners have been Filipino consortiums, although they may tie up with the <coughs> foreign technical groups, but they're putting their money into the Philippines. So if the Filipinos are pouring their money into the Philippines instead of taking it out of the Philippines, they obviously believe in the future of the country. And the second thing I want to say is that we, uh, one of our former trade and industry secretaries, uh, a guy by the name of Johnny Santos, before he became secretary of trade and industry, was uh, um, president of uh, Nestle in the Philippines. And he produced a chart 
uh, in which he showed the uh, net income growth of Nestle in the Philippines uh, over the last, I think, 50 years. And, and the chart showed a constant upward movement. And then he would plot against that, oh, this is the Marcos era, era, era. this was uh, Ramos era, but the chart still kept going that way. And uh, I can actually reproduce that for anybody who, who uh, is interested. Uh, so that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll turn things now next uh, to Robert. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about half a dozen challenges, the biggest challenges that PPPs face. I'm going to do it from two perspectives. First, uh, Floor is both a developer and builder of PPPs in North America and in Europe. And then second, um, the Philippines is a, an attractive and important uh, place for us as a company. We've been in Manila since 1987, opened a second office in Cebu in 2011. Uh, we have a Fab Yard joint venture in the, company, in the country, and altogether uh, employ uh, 2,800 Filipino um, engineers and, and other uh, skilled individuals. Uh, half of them are engineers. The average age of, the, of our offices there is 33. So it's a young staff that is very important to us as a company. And it is also our most innovative office in our company. And I think that says a lot about the, the culture and not just the, uh, the individuals that make, make it up. Uh, so let me talk about a half a dozen challenges and kind of try to give you a perspective on how I see them either being addressed or where there's opportunity yet in the Philippines. So the number one challenge PPPs face is political will. Now we've seen this develop and strengthen over the last several years in the Philippines. The PP Center and its continued improvements uh, now under Pizet is a clear demonstration of this will. And that's something that we find very, very attractive. That's actually a sign of maturity uh, in the PP market from our perspective. Second challenge is good regulation and legislation. This is an area of continued work and this is true almost universally around the world. Um, but it is being worked and I think that's important. For example, ownership of construction companies has been a challenge uh, with the requirement either to be 60% local or to have a special, uh, special license. But the very recent quadruple A that uh, the minister made reference to uh, license is promising, but for us, it'll really hinge on uh, the final rules and regulations uh, that, that uh, surround that. So we're very excited about the possibility and we'll be clearly watching the details because the details are what either will make it workable or not workable for us. Third is efficient processes. And what that means is timely, with reasonable cost, and free of corruption. I think one of the, the, the most noteworthy things I want to offer is that in this infrastructure space globally, and particularly uh, in the Philippines, you can now say the word corruption in public, um, and it's well received. And I think this is very important. So the awards to date, from our perspective, have, have been a little slow. They've taken a little longer than we would like to see. <clears throat> but what we think is the PPP Center really offers hope that the projects will advance up that learning curve. And we recognize that they're in a learning curve. They have the institutional framework to learn from that learning curve. And so we're optimistic about the direction. We'll obviously look to see continued improvement. Risk allocation remains a key area for improvement, though. Uh, for example, the allocation of right-of-way risks is something that troubles us and we know others in the marketplace. Uh, these are risks that uh, the private sector is really not in the best position to take on and manage. Terms and conditions uh, need to continue to evolve to attract more bidders and avoid single uh, bidder situations. Uh, delays in moving projects into the procurement process and efficiently through the process have significant uh, implications for bidders and this is uh, even made even worse if projects are actually canceled. So the PPP Center, during this initial period, uh, one of the recommendations I would uh, offer is that they may want to consider bid stipends in these early days as the market grows comfortable with the process. These are things that you can fade out as you build up uh, a pipeline of projects and experience in the business. And then transparency and a continued focus on combating corruption uh, remain important, and I think they will for some time to come, and I don't think this is just a Philippines issue. Uh, fourth uh, challenge is 
the need for a prioritized pipeline of projects. And this is something that we're very pleased with the, the strengthening that we're seeing in the pipeline development in the Philippines. These projects, and I think, again, I think there's good focus on this, need to not only improve economic efficiency and quality of life, but for the Philippines in particular, also national resilience. And I think a number of the projects now are starting to bring this in as a consideration. The work to date is promising, but confidence in the timing of procurements and awards must continue to improve. It's, it's that uncertainty which is going to be a drag on number of bidders uh, and, quite frankly, also on uh, the quality of the bids, the willingness to make investments. Uh, there's a broad recognition that PP proje PPP projects need to compete globally. So for us, putting a team into the Philippines to develop a P3 project means we're trading off opportunities in North America, uh, Latin America, Africa, Europe, uh, because we see this as a better opportunity. And I think this is an important recognition that's required that when you move into the P3 space, you're competing globally for the resources to develop the projects and the money to fund those projects. Fifth is really the financing frameworks, and Bernie may pick up on this more. Um, need to have both cap capacity and capability uh, that this pipeline that's now developing requires. This means uh, that access to local finance is going to be constrained as project size grows and institutions like IFC, ADB, uh, AIIB, and others are going to become increasingly important. But that means not just the money has to be there. It means that the regulations, legislation, project constructs, and the financial industry itself have to be open to this uh, access to international financing. So that's going to include harmonization and standardization with ASEAN plus three, with ADB, others. Um, and for example, that standardization is going to be important around the areas of debt disclosures and reporting. The Cebu uh, action plan that was referenced earlier by the minister is a very, very positive sign and really hope that that moves forward in the APEC uh, meetings later this year. Uh, and then as funding becomes non-local, political and regulatory risk um, faced by debt must be addressed. Now, likely this will be through further refinement of international arbitration mechanisms that for the, for the Philippines already exist with Singapore and Hong Kong being uh, potential end destinations. Uh, I think also the P3 Center might want to uh, look at uh, not just government subsidy as a uh, way to make projects go, but also some sub-debt features uh, such as the TIFIA feature here in the uh, U.S. I think it may give you uh, more leverage and, and obviously give the government more of an ongoing role in the success of these projects. And sixth, the final uh, uh, challenge, I think, is really um, there needs to develop, and this is often the last of the things to develop in a P3 market, a clear understanding of how government's role changes in the execution process of PPP. So this is always a challenge with bureaucracies, and it's not unique to the Philippines. PPP projects must become performance-based versus having overly prescriptive specifications. This will allow the innovation potential that we see already in the Philippines to really find their way into solving the infrastructure challenge in the Philippines. Terrific. Thank you very much for, for very good remarks to show uh, how the process has evolved and, and how you can take advantage of it and also the things uh, uh, that this is part of a learning curve uh, that, that is moving in the right direction. Uh, for the broadest perspective, we're now going to turn to Bernie Sheehan from the IFC. Uh, look forward to your remarks. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, let me start where, uh, with uh, uh, picking up one of the comments that Guillermo made. Uh, you know, I think he said, uh, it's a good time to come into the Philippines and invest. And I think there are uh, a number of positives uh, about the situation that, uh, that are worth uh, uh, starting with in any, in any uh, discussion on this. And I think we can take off a number of the ones that have already been raised here in terms of the significant improvements on the macroeconomic governance side that we have seen over the last uh, several years. Uh, we look at um, uh, the generally in the investment, investment press worldwide, uh, the Philippines has become uh, one of the destinations most often talked about in, in, a, in a positive standpoint uh, because of these reforms, because of the perceptions of progress on the anti-corruption uh, drive, uh, because of some inherent 
uh, features as have already been mentioned with the uh, productivity of the labor force, uh, languages, uh, very high domestic savings. So all these things are, 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 are good. Secondly, I think that the focus that the uh, uh, current administration has been putting for the last few years on infrastructure as a key bottleneck clearly makes sense uh, in the situation that the Philippines finds itself in. Having reaped a number of the benefits from the uh, reform, uh, macroeconomic reform process to date. Uh, I think the Philippines is looking going forward at the same kind of dilemma that a lot of the other reforming emerging markets have faced over the last few years, which is the risk of declining productivity um, in spite of further reforms. So without significant improvements on the infrastructure side, the likelihood that the macroeconomic reforms continue to translate into economic growth starts becoming much more uh, complicated. So here, there's also good news in terms of where the Philippines has been. Aside from its current focus, the Philippines has, at, at many stages, been uh, one of the early leaders amongst emerging markets in terms of uh, particularly engaging the private sector and private capital into infrastructure. The Philippines were one of the first to move on uh, IPPs uh, back uh, a couple of decades ago, and similarly have been the source of innovation in a number of sectors, including, uh, including, the, including the water sector. Um, <clears throat> I think as we uh, see from the PPP Center, and uh, it's uh, great to have uh, Cosette uh, here on the panel uh, as well, um, illustrates that there's a lot of planning capacity, uh, including at the detailed project level uh, in the Philippines, which is needed to uh, bring pipeline of uh, projects forward, particularly in the, uh, in the transport side. And for IFC, uh, IFC, uh, the Philippines has been a very good destination for us in terms of investment. Uh, it has historically been one of our larger uh, destinations for infrastructure investment uh, globally. In fact, up until a few months ago, uh, our infrastructure portfolio in the Philippines was twice the size of our infrastructure portfolio in China. So it has been a place where we have been able to put a lot of capital. Uh, our returns on that capital have been uh, very good uh, over time. Uh, uh, accompanying the various reforms, going back to the early BOTs, the privatization phase, uh, even some of the off-grid uh, power uh, that, uh, that the government has gone into. So with all that said, there's still very significant challenges, I think, for, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the government to reach the objectives that it has. And I think here we observe that the infrastructure plans that the government has are still significantly outrunning the quality of the infrastructure on the ground. So the plan to get to infrastructure investment on the level of 5% plus of GDP, uh, as has been uh, put forward by President Aquino, makes sense. But um, infrastructure investment levels are still just reaching about 3% of GDP, which still puts the Philippines in the lower portion uh, in terms of infrastructure investment as a percentage of GDP of many of the uh, emerging markets. And frankly, I think as you see in Manila uh, and you see in other parts of the country, even for all the capacity and the positive history that the Philippines has around infrastructure and introducing the private sector into infrastructure, the quality of some of the infrastructure remains frankly terrible. And I think that's an observation that is, that is clear to, to everyone. So uh, the trouble as now the Philippines is trying to get to a different level in terms of investment, uh, particularly investment of private capital into infrastructure to deal with this, and it's got the right objectives, and it's got the right targets, and it has a lot of capacity in terms of moving forward. The problem is a little bit what Bob mentioned a few minutes ago, which is the Philippines in trying to do so is competing globally with probably every large emerging market around the world, which is similarly trying to uh, deal with declining productivity, trying to focus on infrastructure and infrastructure improvements as a way to get to improving productivity and, re and restoring stronger economic growth. And 
every one, all of these emerging markets are trying to do things at least on the scale of what the Philippines are trying to do, if not more. So if you go to uh, Mexico, you go to Brazil, you go to Indonesia, you go to Egypt, uh, you go to India, you go to a number of smaller markets, you go to Bangladesh, you go to Ethiopia, you go to Kenya, you go to Ghana. Every single one of these countries that I've just mentioned has the intention to create more, for example, power generation capacity in the next five years than exists in the entire country to date. So every major emerging market today has extremely ambitious plans on how, on what they want to do in infrastructure, and every single of those markets intends to get there by significantly scaling up private capital flowing into infrastructure. So the issue, there's a big issue for the Philippines of how does it achieve uh, both getting this pipeline of more projects out and capturing the investment and the financing that is needed to turn that into, uh, into a reality. And as we look at that, I think, you know, I would suggest three areas that um, in particular are areas that um, make sense to think about. One is the kind of work that is already ongoing and which um, uh, Cosette alluded to in, in detail, which is progress on the specifics of individual transactions, of individual opportunities to bring transactions to market. And I think here, the Philippines is, in, in our mind, clearly in the upper uh, echelon of capacity amongst emerging markets in trying to do that, particularly on the transport side. I would mention in passing that uh, uh, IFC has uh, an advisory practice in terms of uh, helping governments uh, structure uh, PPPs, uh, structure private infrastructure and bring it to market. And our single largest program of investment anywhere in the world in transport is in the Philippines. So I think that's an area which needs a lot of work in the Philippines as in, in, in every country and will continue to need work but where the Philippines is, is, in, is, uh, is uh, going in the right direction. The second big challenge, I think was alluded to in some detail by Bob a couple of minutes ago, which is the issue of process efficiency. So it's, the Philippines um, is not lacking in planning capacity, is not lacking in knowing what it wants to do, is not even lacking, I think, in the decision making of going forward, but the processes uh, are uh, still extremely slow, and compared to emerging markets peers, as opposed to the planning capacity, which is in the upper part of, qual of the spectrum of quality, the process efficiency is more towards the lower end. And then finally, there's a broader issue, which I think as we look across emerging markets and we see reforms taking place in a number of those countries that is worth putting on the table, which is the broader, the more macro approach to the system. And in, um, uh, I was, uh, I noted one of the comments that Bob made about uh, floor across the emerging markets and their experience in the Philippines, and Bob mentioned that Manila is the most innovative office uh, uh, for floor worldwide. Now, one of the problems is that quality of innovation, which is definitely there, also applies to regulation. The Philippines has some of the most innovative regulatory barriers that you are going to find anywhere in the world. <clears throat> And this can be good at a micro level in terms of dealing with very specific problems that these regulations are trying to address. But when you add all of that innovation together, uh, uh, it becomes quite challenging uh, uh, in terms of its overall effects. Uh, a couple of uh, examples here to close off on this. One of the things, and I'll, I'll go to the area of renewable energy. One of the things that we have observed over the last 12 to 18 months is a number of these emerging markets that are trying to reform and trying to capture private capital have, specifically in the area of renewable energy, made dramatic improvements and dramatic innovation, uh, dramatic improvements in terms of the structure of procurement. We look at the auction programs for renewable energy. Specifically, we look at those programs that have been rolled out in Brazil, that have rolled out in South Africa, that have rolled out in India, and more recently in Jordan and the uh, United uh, Emirates. What we see is that countries have figured out an aggregate approach to how they want to procure, really reinvented from scratch, quite different than the procurement programs that they had before. 
and have succeeded at getting significantly larger levels of private capital than they had anticipated and building up their generation capacity in renewables significantly faster than they had anticipated at significantly lower costs than they had anticipated. Now, that's really the trifecta that you would want in a procurement program for infrastructure. And in each of those cases, the governments basically started from scratch and said, okay, how are we going to get to the finish line that we want? And all of those have succeeded in doing so. By contrast, if we look at the procurement of renewable energy in the Philippines today, and this is an area where IFC will, in the next few weeks, announce a major investment of about $230 million in the sector, so we're quite positive about it and bullish about it. We, notice, we note that some of the regulations that apply here that are very specific to the Philippines in terms of foreign ownership, in terms of the complexity of uh, tariff guarantees that are offered in this, uh, in this sector, are very significant impediments and are very different to what the, uh, the Philippines' competitors are doing in terms of attracting the amount of capital in. A second example that I'll, that I'll give and I'll close off is Mexico, another country uh, not dissimilar in terms of uh, size of the economy, not dissimilar in terms of the scope of the ambitions uh, on uh, infrastructure. And if we, see, if we look at the scale and the depth of the changes in procurement and the changes in regulation that Mexico is uh, undergoing in order to capture the investment that it wants uh, in energy in particular, it's significantly deeper than what we've seen to date in the Philippines reform program. So I think this is the situation, I think, as we see it is a lot of tremendous positives for the Philippines today. Very much on the right track, uh, very much on the right target, tremendous capacity, but some important things to think about in terms of achieving the ambitious objectives that it has here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I arrive at this point of the conversation being uh, uh, optimistic and uh, seeing the glass is half full and more water flowing into the glass. Uh, and and um, it seems as if the Philippine economy is, is uh, developing quickly. It seems potentially quite sustainable uh, compared to previous eras where you had a, a, a lot of uh, volatility in growth. Uh, and if you look at reform measures in other place, in other countries around the region or, or more broadly, where there's being more, more progress in the Philippines uh, compared to elsewhere, if you look at the, the challenges Abe is facing in Japan, uh, other ASEAN countries, uh, even the challenges China is facing, uh, facing uh, with, a, with a very strong hand by, by Xi Jinping, uh, it seems like there's, uh, the Philippines has a very good story to tell. Um, at the same time, it seems to me that uh, although there's a lot of competition uh, for projects, uh, there's also a, a, a lot of available capital and capacity and knowledge uh, to feed into all of these so that it doesn't have to be that the Philippines has to necessarily compete with others uh, for these, this capital because uh, the demand is there and, and the institutional changes and everything are, are on the pro in the process of being made. Uh, I thought I'd use my prerogative as, as chair just to ask two questions of the, of the panel, uh, one a micro question and then one a macro question. Uh, the, I guess the first, the micro, would be maybe, because uh, and, and others feel free to chime in, in terms, if you could just maybe talk about some of the specific cases uh, of the recent uh, public-private partnerships uh, that your center has helped uh, organize uh, an example of, of how things have changed from the past and sort of and the learning curve that you're on uh, and how that is perceived by others in terms of specific examples um, and then I'll, I'll hold off and, and wait for my the second question yes uh, thank you Scott well um, since uh started in 2010, one of the innovative ways by which we could accelerate uh, uh, the pipeline development was the creation of the project development monitoring facility. Um, uh, we, uh, using ADB guidelines, we were able to procure uh, transaction advisors and consultants for the implementing agencies on, on a much shorter uh, period of time. And um, that we, we, we are also thinking of expanding it to include um, uh, providing of uh, uh, consultancy services to the implementing agencies to assist them during the early phase of uh, execution. 
uh, like for example, an independent consultant or engineer during the construction period. Again, that's one bottleneck that we've identified and we are working on expanding the PDM of services to also address that. Um, another, um, we, we, Bob talked about, uh, I think, process improvements, which I think I failed to um, articulate late, earlier on. But indeed, uh, in terms of uh, project uh, planning or project uh, development, uh, we've, uh, um, we've uh, created a separate process for evaluation as well as approval for PPP project, and that was only put in place last year. And uh, uh, but when we when we did that, there was really a jump in the number of uh, PPP projects that were approved uh, by the government, and that's one of the again the innovations that uh, we've uh, we came up with. Uh, the 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 government of the Philippines uh, through the PPP Governing Board and the PPP Center also issued several policy guidelines to um, for 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 the implement uh, implementing agencies uh, the uh, pipeline development to assist them in the prioritization selection of their uh, projects, viability gap funding, which uh, Bob alluded to in terms of uh, government providing subsidy to certain PPP projects. We also uh, came up with the PPP best practices, and one of which is uh, the free interaction with the private sector during the bidding process. And that's that one we've institutionalized and it's been accepted by the various implementing agencies, uh, most uh, especially by the two infra agencies, the TPWH and the DOTC. Now, there, that's quite a um, mind shift because as, uh, even though we've had the build operate transfer law since uh, 1990s, um, uh, most uh, agencies are used to using the traditional procurement, uh, which uh, forbids um, um, interaction uh, with the private sector. And they, it, in, in some cases, there's, uh, there's a no contact rule, which is uh, totally opposite of what we're trying to do in the PVPs. Before we bid out our projects, we want interaction with the market feedback, uh, and feedback from the investors, the lenders, so that when we go out and, uh, and ask for uh, bid submissions, then we'd have uh, a, a more successful rate of doing so. And uh, that's what uh, we've also included in our uh, PPP best uh, practices. So I guess, um, Scott. That helps, that helps a lot. Uh, yeah, let me uh, just offer a couple comments. First, I wanna get uh, maybe back to the, to the premise of the question, sure. that, it, that it appears there shouldn't be any constraint. I, I don't think the constraint is money. I don't even think necessarily the constraint is good projects, but everything is relative in life. And the choke point in, in the P3 processor just quite frankly, the sheer number of deal teams that are out there to put these projects together, the cost that those deal teams will occur through the bidding process, and the amount of time that you're tying up those deal teams because of extended procurements. So streamlined procurements uh, with, with a lot of the key issues, and you're already addressing some of this with the discussions during the procurement process, this is huge, uh, but anything that shortens those time frames and takes out some of the the risk mm -hmm. uh, uh, associated with the bidding process itself mm -hmm. is going to result in you being much more competitive globally. Um, Bernie talked about a number of the macro factors um, in the industry and the and the positive nature of those macro factors, and I would just kind of reinforce the good macro has to be complemented by good micro, and the good micro here is really about process efficiency, and you know it's not something I can point to as a fact but just kind of gut reaction is I think there's about twice as many hoops, uh, regulations, uh, uh, approvals, whatever you want to call it, uh, for a comparable size traction, uh, transaction in the Philippines versus let's call it your, your competitor set. And that, that I think is, uh, is an area for uh, a good scope. And then maybe just one last comment. Uh, and I think, uh, again, Bernie made the point on the quality of the infrastructure, it's not just the, the number of miles, it's the quality of those miles. And this is where I think you have uh, an opportunity to not only improve quality, but to accelerate the bidding process. And that's by moving much more to performance-based uh, specifications, performance-based procurements, because now you can hold the bidder's feet to the fire and the quality uh, of that infrastructure, the performance of that infrastructure over an extended period of time. It makes your bid process easier. It also reduces, it won't eliminate, for the various agencies to want to go in and influence the design in the P3 process. They have to move into mode of accepting the design as meeting the performance spec. I think this is a huge opportunity for you. 
All right, let me, let me ask a, a, a macro question. Um, you know, if, if you travel around the United States and you drive on the roads of our nation's capital or elsewhere, you won't get the immediate sense that we have wonderful infrastructure, right? Uh, but I travel to China a lot, uh, and I, I just uh, drove down some wonderful highways. Um, I uh, went on a high-speed train, wonderful subway. You know, China seems to be infrastructure central. Um, in addition, uh, China just led the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, which has now 57 members. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about the um, relative interest in, in, in attracting infrastructure investment from China. I know the AIB is not supposed to be a Chinese representative, it's supposed to be an international multilateral development bank. Um, but that opportunity relative to the opportunity that American companies and others have um, uh, in uh, this, this, uh, these opportunities uh, in the Philippines. I think uh, in many uh, uh, emerging markets, uh, China is the single largest non-domestic source of capital for infrastructure. Uh, the scope of Chinese investment in infrastructure uh, has been huge, uh, uh, significantly larger than, say, the World Bank Group or multilateral institutions put together uh, if, you, uh, if you add it up. Uh, I think the issue uh, has been, uh, or the issue going forward, for governments looking to capture Chinese uh, capital um, is a lot around what model does that capital flow into. And just for the purposes of simplification, we can call it two different models. Uh, one being, uh, again, to stereotype the China Inc. model, uh, and the second, um, again, for the purpose of stereotyping, international best practice model. Uh, I think we can uh, probably observe that the significant majority of uh, uh, infrastructure investment, cross-border infrastructure investment by China, uh, has historically been in the first of those models, uh, typically characterized by things like government-to-government -government, uh, sourcing, uh, by uh, uh, non-competitive uh, procurement, uh, and use of uh, Chinese uh, uh, Chinese uh, ownership, uh, construction, uh, Chinese labor, and Chinese capital uh, put together uh, with uh, then standards that are applicable to that uh, just to the uh, just to the Chinese uh, Chinese groups. I think we can also, however, observe that in recent years there's starting to be more investment flowing cross-border investment flowing from China in a different type of model. So we see whether it be Chinese SOEs bidding for um, uh, procurement uh, opportunities uh, that are in projects that are owned and operated by non-Chinese um, uh, non-Chinese partners. We have uh, started to see most more recently Chinese capital beginning to flow in an entirely untied uh, way. Uh, the ISC, for example, has had for about 18 months a $3 billion uh, line of credit from the state agency for foreign exchange in China, which has no ties to uh, any uh, Chinese uh, partners uh, in the projects which receive that uh, financing, and where the decision making uh, on that investment is entirely delegated to the IFC. Uh, so I think we see um, <clears throat> the AIIB, uh, for example, uh, as being something which given the decisions that have been made on the shareholding, uh, likely to line up more in that second, uh, in that second, uh, second camp. So I think we would think that both types of channels are likely to continue, but for a host government, whether it be the Philippines or another emerging market, uh, the question is really what, which of these two channels do I want to uh, engage with? Uh, turn things open, uh, turn things over to the floor, and... Uh
Right here? Yes. Uh, we have a microphone that's coming your way. There you go. Sorry. Thank you. The question probably should be uh, more or less addressed to the, the gentleman from IFC. Uh, as, you, as you know, the World Bank Group is well respected around the world, probably more especially in developing countries. Um, you had mentioned about um, the accompaniment of advisory capacity uh, in your lending program to the Philippines. I presume that includes technical assistance, and I presume it includes monitoring of your loan investments to the Philippines. Could you let us know what is the best success story you have on the Philippine program? How much have you lent the Philippines, and what is the outstanding balance? Okay. okay. Um, Thank you, uh, thank you for the uh, for the question. Uh, as I mentioned in, in, in my remarks, uh, Philippines has actually been uh, one of the uh, uh, largest uh, partners for us uh, on the infrastructure side uh, over time, uh, both in terms of uh, investment and uh, and advisory. Um, in investment, actually, uh, the Philippines, relative to other countries, had one of the highest ratios for us of infrastructure investments as a portion of our overall investment activity. And for many years, uh, infrastructure was over half of the total investments we were making in the Philippines, as opposed to on a global basis for IFC, that being about 20 or 25 percent. On the advisory side, uh, we have had uh, an extensive engagement on infrastructure. And that is uh, what I'm referring to here is transaction advisory, where we work with the PPP center or other counterparts to help uh, the government uh, on the detail planning and detail bringing to market of individual opportunities, generally in the uh, form of a uh, international, uh, of a public tender. Uh, within that uh, space, uh, the two largest areas of activity for us have been on the transport side, and currently that is uh, by far and away, I think, where our um, support is, um, uh, is concentrated, including uh, working probably the project we work the longest on, I would say, would be the um, uh, 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 LRT Line 1, yeah, that uh, I remember working on maybe 12 years ago, uh, and that uh, came to market, uh, I think, about a year ago. So uh, it was, uh, was quite a long uh, process, but we're very pleased that that got uh, through. And then the second area was uh, advising on uh, off-grid electrification or small-grid electrification uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the Philippines. Um, so those two activities I should uh, specify are quite separate within uh, the IFC. Uh, on the one side, it's uh, advisory to governments handled by one team, and then the investments are handled by a totally separate, uh, totally separate group. And the quality and the impact of the investments is monitored from the uh, from the investment side. Uh, I. Uh, would think there were actually very few instances, if any, that I can think of where IFC has then subsequently invested uh, in um, transactions that were prepared by our advisory side, uh, which underlies that historically capital has not been a big constraint uh, for infrastructure in the Philippines. That may change as the country tries to scale up uh, it's uh, a private infrastructure program, but historically the, the uh, transactions that we have helped the government bring forward uh, have found other sources of finance than, uh, than IFC. It's right here in the front. I'm uh, Larry Nix from uh, CSIS. In the past, one of the major corruption issues in the Philippines has focused on the Customs Bureau in the Philippines. A couple of past presidents I know have targeted the Customs Bureau in previous anti-corruption campaigns with apparent minimal success. I know that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has addressed this issue 
a number of times in its recommendations to the Philippine government. So in the context of whether the Philippines can attract American construction companies to come into the Philippines, my first part of my question is, for American construction companies operating in the Philippines today, in terms of importing materials and equipment, which I'm sure they have to do, how extensive do they have to deal with the Philippines Customs Bureau? And secondly, is a continued problem with the Customs Bureau a continued disincentive for American construction firms in terms of the attractiveness of the Philippines? And also, does the progress that many of you have cited today on the corruption issue in the Philippines include progress in reforming the Customs Bureau, which you could use in advertising and trying to attract American construction companies? And just a footnote that this Customs problem is not unique to the Philippines. I know what Indonesia, for example, has gone through uh, with this. But it has been, I know, a big problem. And I think in terms of the subject of what you all have been talking about today, uh, it may be a particular problem. Uh, the Customs Bureau. Thank you. Question should have been asked when Secretary Purisima was here, but I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> well, I, and definitely um, um, the bureau, uh, reforms in the Bureau of Customs is very much part of the of the of uh, the good news that we are offering to the world. But uh, we are also uh, the government is also cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of uh, things that need to be done at the Bureau of Customs. But uh, the, the the reforms continue, and they they've uh, instituted several mechanisms. By which to simplify processes and make it easier for uh, importers uh, and export uh, importers to to deal with the Bureau of Customs. But that that's the, the extent that I could say about <laughs> that matter, though. But maybe Bob could be able to answer the other part of the question. Yeah, let me just, let me just offer it this way. First of all, the construction, if you will, that we're doing today in the Philippines would be in our uh, fab yard, and that's a jointly owned fab yard. Um, but I, I guess really just two comments. One, uh, I've not heard this being an issue for us in terms of either the import of equipment or the ultimate export of, uh, of uh, fabricated modules. Um, second, uh, I have to tell you the, the one thing that the U.S. government has done for American business over the years that is hugely powerful is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, I think the world has figured out it's not even worth the time to ask uh, anymore. So I'd like to personally thank Congress and whatever administration signed that into law. And then last, maybe a comment more specifically on infrastructure. Almost, uh, or I'll say differently, with limited exceptions of very specialized pieces of equipment control systems or something like that, a lot of, a lot of the basic uh, materials of construction uh, are going to be sourced locally. Labor is going to be sourced locally. So uh, infrastructure maybe is contrasted with uh, a different manufacturing process, I think, is going to have uh, um, less challenges. Not that there'll be zero, but less challenges than maybe some of what was experienced before. But like I said, I, it, this has not risen to the level of somebody saying we're not getting done what we need to get done there because of issues over at the Customs Bureau. Terrific. Um, because of, of time, I think we have time for just one more question here before we wrap things up. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much. Yes, um, considering the potential and progress that this panel has made quite very effectively in portraying the Philippines as making a headway towards uh, membership in the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP program, which I understand would cover something like about 40% of global trade Altogether, at the present time, that there are 12 members, and if the Philippines will be 
probably the 13th member. Uh, bottom line is that would any in the panel or all of you or some of you could sort of speculate seriously as to what would be the time frame in the Philippines so far, so far as number of years that the Philippines would succeed in becoming a member of TPP? Thank you. Yeah, um, I wish any of us knew uh, when the first round of the t negotiations will conclude. Uh, the news from Congress on TPA seems relatively positive, um, uh, but it'll, it'll and, and hopefully we've got a calendar that will will have those negotiations conclude, uh, wrap up this year, and put it uh, and have it ratified and entered. That's potentially an optimistic assessment. Um, I think then it, there's a whole lot of variables uh, in terms of what happens for the second round. Uh, as, as several have noted, uh, there are a variety of uh, elections that are coming up uh, in, the, in the United States, the Philippines, and elsewhere that are going to affect uh, Asia-Pacific relations uh, and, and the chances for where TPP goes forward. I'm generally an optimist, uh, and as I'm a glass half full with water pouring into the glass on the Philippines, I'm even more so on, on TPP. And I also think it's incredibly important as well uh, for the region and elsewhere. Um, this has been a terrific discussion. Uh, everyone, please